Awesome, Martin. Thanks for joining me. We had a couple hiccups there, but glad that we got it all resolved. And um, now we can have a great chat. So, uh, yeah, if you could introduce yourself a little bit of uh, your background and what you do, that'd be great. Sure. So, uh, Andres, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be with you. Uh, my name is Martin Salama. Uh, I live here in Brooklyn, New York. And uh, I've been a life coach for the last, I don't know, 12, 13 years. And I put together a program where I, I help individuals, mostly entrepreneurs, but anybody, shift their mindset from lack to abundance, really on a deeper level, it's from like self-conscious to self-aware. Uh, through working with me and specific techniques, I help them recognize that they can do anything they want as long as they have the right mindset for it. Awesome. And what did you do before this? So before that, I was always an entrepreneur. I was a businessman. I did, you know, back then we didn't use the word entrepreneur, but <laughs> I was a businessman. I was always in different businesses, um, mostly uh, uh, goods. Like uh, when I was a kid, I was in tablecloths with my dad. Then I was in costume jewelry, and then I moved to things like real estate. Uh, and then and, uh, right around the turn of 2000 into 2003, 2002, 2003, my wife and I started a project to build a multi-million dollar health club and tennis center in New Jersey. And this came about because my wife came to me one day and she said, you just closed the business. You're looking for something to do, which I really wasn't at that moment, but she insisted I was. <laughs> and she said, I've been started taking tennis recently and I can never find a court, a tennis court. Uh, there's not enough courts for the area. Why don't we do that? Why don't we open up some tennis courts as a way of, as a new, new source of income? So I said, okay, let's look into it. So I, I found somebody who did a feasibility study and came back and said, yeah, there's definitely a place to do uh, tennis courts in your area. Seven or eight courts would be great. But I want to warn you that if you're just going to do tennis courts, don't expect to make a ton of money from it because it's not enough to sustain a, a, a great income. You need to add to it. Health club, so on and so forth. So what started out as Okay, let's look at the tennis. Became a fifteen million dollar project, health club, tennis, uh, basketball court, you name it, spa, pool, everything, all under one thing—a hundred and plus thousand square foot facility. And we then started down the road of finding the land, getting the architect, building that up, you know, doing all that, the engineers. Then going to the city to get their approval, and they're like, oh, this looks great, but you need to do a civil engineer to find out how's it going to affect the parking, how's it going to affect the traffic. This took us five years, and over $3 million worth of my money and my investors' money along the way. So we finally get all the approvals we need from the state and the city in the summer of 2008. Now, Andres, if it was in 2006 or 2007, the banks were lending like you can't imagine. I actually refinanced my house a few times while I was going through this process of building, you know, the, these plans and everything. But for me, it happened to be in the summer of 2008. I go to the bank. I'm like, okay, we're ready now. And like, yeah, we're not <laughs> lending right now. I'm like, what? Last year you told me when you're ready, come to us. It's all great. Well, things have changed. A month later, Bernie Madoff, subprime loans, the financial world falls apart. I know that's 15 plus years ago now, but for me, it feels like almost yesterday <laughs> because overnight I was wiped out financially. So much so I stopped paying my mortgage. I stopped paying my car payments and all that stuff. A few months later, my son tells dad, look out the window. They were towing away my BMW. Mm. And I got repossessed and my house went into foreclosure, but because I lived in New Jersey, and there were so many other houses that were in foreclosure, it took them years until they finally remembered about me and came and actually foreclosed on the house. Years. But uh, I, I was basically wiped out. And it took me about a year to get out of that um, depression that I was in because I would lost everything. And I, I didn't know what I was going to do next. I went through therapy. I even went through some coaching. And about a year later, I recognized that this depression I was in was situational. They told me it was situational, but living it, you don't feel it. You got to get through it. So I said, okay, now what do I want to do with the rest of my life? 
and I thought about where I'd been in my life, the things I've done. And one of the things I was always very happy doing was being involved in community events. I was always a leader. And as a leader, if people come in and they go, well, I can't do what you're doing, Martin. I'm like, well, I don't want you to do what I'm doing. I want you to do what you feel comfortable doing. And I would literally coach them to what their potential was for that community organization. So I started putting things together. I was like, well, maybe I should become a life coach. <laughs> so I said, okay, that's what I'm going to do. And I looked it into it, and I researched it, and I found a great coaching uh, school to go to. And about two months before the, the, the training was going to start, it was my 24th wedding anniversary. And my wife said to me, I'm done. I want a divorce. I'm like, oh, my God. Why does everything keep happening to me? It's just like piling on. I'm just finally getting myself out of the pile that I was in, all this rut I was in, and now she hits me with this. You can imagine I was feeling every emotion across the board. And of course, I, said, I, I wish I said to her, but I didn't get anything like that for you. <laughs> you <know? laughs> but I didn't. And, um, and I thought about, well, well what am I going to do now? And I decided, you know what? I'm still going to go through with the idea of going to coach training. And I think that was God t t tapping me on the shoulder and saying, you should continue to do this. And now that you're at rock bottom, you're going to learn some stuff about yourself that you want to coach others, you got to figure yourself out first. And right before I started coach training, they sent me a list of books and they said, read a couple of the books on this list. And one of them was a book by Don Miguel Ruiz called The Four Agreements. <laughs> you know that book, huh, Andres? It's a great book, great book. Fantastic book. It was a life changer for me. And when I read that second agreement, don't take anything personally, I felt like Miguel was talking directly to me, saying, this is the secret that people have been telling you your whole life, but up until now you weren't ready to hear it, and now here it is. And it changed my life because I now went into that coach training session that first weekend saying, okay, I'm open. I'm willing to hear what needs to change. And they said to me that weekend, you don't have to be who you think you have to be. You could be whoever you want to be. And I was like, oh, wow. Because the old me was a people pleaser. I always felt like I needed to make everybody happy. My wife, when I started that project five years earlier, six years earlier, and I'm not even an athlete. And here I am opening up a, a tennis center, a health center. <laughs> Find the irony in that. But... <laughs> And I started to unravel these things that the reason I take things personally was because I was a people pleaser. And as a result, I was a control freak. And I always had to look, I was looking for a recognition and approval. And when all those things weren't happening, I had a short temper and I would freak out. I would react to everything. So I started unpacking these stuff and I said, oh, this is why things don't happen the way they should be. And I started to understand what I was doing to myself, let alone what I was doing to everybody else. Hmm. I've talked to quite a few guys and they all seem to have similar stories, I'd say. Like there's there's always a, a turning point, right? Where they go like, well, I got to figure something out. Something has to change because... I used to think people don't change, but now I think people don't change until they're forced to. So, I mean, you you ha you have to go looking for it yourself, right? Like, because one thing I noticed that I've gone through this work myself, and and um, and now I'm trying to be a coach myself, is like you said, right? You have to go through it all yourself first, and you have to figure out yourself first. But um, it's not uh, it's not something that comes out of the blue, right? Like it's it's not something that um, that you can just sit down and figure out. Like you have to have been pushed into it uh, by life. Like right? It's 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 yeah, yeah. I, I talk about how when things are going great, right? Even if somewhere deep and down inside you're not happy, you'll dismiss it because things are going great. But when things are going bad, you find that that's the time you do introspection. Like, why is thing, are things going bad? What's going on here? 
what am I contributing to this? And to the, for the for some people, they don't even go that far. And for me, I at first, my answer was, why is everything happening to me? Right? And really what that answer is, that's me blaming everybody else for what's going on. Right? And I would rationalize that that was okay because in the bigger picture, it was everybody else's fault. Oh, the world fell apart. The financial world fell apart. But what I've come to learn, Andres, is that the word rationalize is really two words. Rational lies. (laughs) I like that. (laughs) You tell yourself lies that it's rational to go against what you know inside is really what you should be doing because it may be for the bigger picture, to make somebody else happy, or to feed your ego. Hmm. You know? And at the end of the day, you're really just telling yourself a lie and you're saying it's rational to say it. So I changed that mindset of why is everything happening to me to everything happens through me and I'm responsible for whatever goes on. Yeah, it's complete ownership, right? Sort of like the, not not David Goggins, but... um... The, the Navy SEAL, I forget his name, that wrote the, the book uh, Complete Ownership. Yeah, um, I know who you mean. I don't know his name, but I know who you mean. Yeah, I'll have to find it. Um, but, he, yeah. uh, but he takes that perspective, right? It's like you, you have to fully take um, ownership of everything that happens in your life. And, you know, at the end of the day, it sort of helps. Um, it, it allows you to realize that you're in the driver's seat. And that's a good feeling, you know, it's, it, yeah. you can see it as a positive or you can see it as a negative, right? You can see it as, as, oh, hey, like I'm in control because that's a lot, that's a lot of people's problem, right? They feel like they're not in control. Like they're, they feel like life's happening to them um, right. Right. rather it, than I have no them, choice. like you said. Mm. You know, they, I have no choice. Yes, you do. You really do. And, and when I, and when I talked earlier about being a control freak, I, wasn't, I was really trying to control everybody else. I had to learn that the only person I could control was myself. Mm-hmm. And whoever along the way that I was controlling, I had to learn that it wasn't up to me what happened in their lives. My children, my ex-wife, whoever. I needed to move forward from there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the guy's name is Jocko Willenick, by the way, in case anybody okay, wants great. to look, look that up. But... Um, yeah, I mean, yeah. What, what you're describing, I don't know if you've ever heard of like this, it's called nice guy syndrome, maybe, you know, um, there's a book, uh, <laughs> there's another book that I, um, it's called No More Mr. Nice Guy, and um, I, I recommend that to a lot of guys, it's, it's basically um, what you're describing, right, where it's like you're trying to please everyone, and, and a lot of guys, and, and this book is directed towards men, but um, uh, because it's, it hurts men more than it hurts women, but, uh, basically you're raised to be, you know, to, to fit into a mold a little bit, right? Like, like you have to please everybody. You have to, um, everybody, you have to get along with everybody. And if somebody doesn't like you, you have to go and fix that as if there's something wrong with it. Right. And you can, you, you go through life sort of like, trying to fix everything and, and, and not taking the time to think where you want to go and take your own path, right? Like define your own path. Um, and, and then you fall into rut and this is, and, and that's what happens right later in life. It comes back to bite you. Um, yep. exactly right. And it took mm-hmm. me, it took me close to 50 years because to me to understand that that's who I was. Most people, don't even realize that they're a people pleaser. Like you said, they think they're being a nice guy. They Mm -hmm. think it's their job to make everybody happy. They think it's job to be, you know, to be friends with everybody. You don't have to be friends with everyone. It just doesn't work. It's not possible to please everyone at the end of the day. Like I said, I was a leader. And one one of the organizations I was leading, for many years I was trying to make sure that everybody was happy. And finally, I realized it's not possible. Somebody's not gonna be happy. As long as I'm not hurting anybody, that's the important thing. And that's the mantra I started to tell myself after that first weekend of training, of coach training, is that I've got to take care of myself first. 
as long as I'm not hurting anybody. Right? I think there's a, there's something in marketing where there's it's a concept, I think, in marketing. Or maybe it's not marketing, but in any case, it's um, there's the people that hate you. There's the people that like you and there's everybody in between and you should focus on the ones in between to try to bring them to the, to the, you know, to the right. side that like you, right? It's, right that's it's the sales like, part of it, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, and the example they always give is, is like Trump, you know? It's like there's people that like say what you want about politics, right? But like um, there's the people that absolutely hate him. There's the people that will never stop loving him and there's the people in between, which is... <laughs> well, I'm right. sure where he puts his efforts to, towards, right? Where he but, puts most of his effort. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So. <laughs> True. <laughs> yeah. But there's one thing, um, and I wanted, I'm curious to take, get your take on it, right? Um, is that something I've been personally focusing on is, um, I don't know if you've ever heard this saying where there's, everybody has three people, right, in, inside of them. There's the, peop- there's the person they show to others there's the person they show to their close friends and family, and then there's the person that they don't show to anybody. Um, and something I've been really focusing on is bringing those three egos right into one and, and, wow. and just being the same person no matter where I go. And obviously the, the one that you don't show to anybody is the most difficult to sort of merge in, right? Because those are like things that you've hidden away from, from the world and that you're embarrassed about. But, you know, little by little, I've been, I guess it's been like a testing thing, right? Where I've been like showing those sides of myself. Um, and it's been going great, actually. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but, uh, but it's because it's w- what I realized is that it, it's exhausting to have those three egos, right? Like those mm-hmm. three alter egos. And if yeah. you just blend them all together, you wake up and you're just always yourself. Like you're o- like no matter what. And, and you can sort of just... If if someone likes you, they like you, and if they don't, you don't, and you're not in the sweat on your back, right? So, so I'm yeah, curious that's a, if, if that's great, <laughs> it's fantastic. I, I I never heard of it put that way before, and I like it. But I could also imagine that some people out there are saying, "Oh, I could never show the people I don't show anybody. I can't show that to right. anybody." For, oh, it's because, terrifying. It could be embarrassment. It could be fear. It could be a, 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 a ton of stuff. But it's it's an unbelievable thing to aspire to do so congratulations good for you thank you thank you yeah it's i'm not gonna say it's easy right i mean obviously not i had that same fear that you just mentioned so um right but, i mean know, i remember day, day to day i remember giving somebody the four agreements uh she's actually it's the time she was my girlfriend and now i'm very happy to say we've been married five years uh second marriage beautiful fantastic uh, second Great time move. around even better <laughs> but I just uh, by the way before I tell you that other part looking back now other than my four children and now eight grandchildren her, my, my ex-wife asking me for the divorce was probably the greatest gift she ever gave me hmm. but anyway so I gave the book to my my then girlfriend the four agreements and she texted me one day and she said agreement number two don't take anything personally is impossible and my answer to her was, if you say so. If you believe that, then that's what it is. And she's like, what? I go, you see, you took it personally. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it, it's a choice you make every day, right? So, yeah. yeah. Now, is it, do, I, am I, do I take nothing personally? No. But I'd like to believe that I'm in the 90 percentile of where I don't take things personally. Right. Yeah, and I mean... Well, I've been told that between, I guess, hearing something and reacting to it, there's a space in between, right? And you can just oh, yeah. get better at stopping and, and feeling that space. Um, <laughs> it's exactly right? a part of my, my coaching is exactly what you just said because I was somebody who reacted. I heard something. I felt it. I reacted within seconds. Right? I got a thought, an emotion, and a reaction. And I had to learn that there could be distance between those things. Mm-hmm. And you use the word stop, and it's so funny because it's part of my course, part of my, the way I mm. teach people. And I tell them, remember when you were a kid in, in school and the fireman would come to the class and teach you fire safety? 
right? And he'd say, children, there's three words you got to go home with to remember in case of a fire. Stop, drop, and roll. Okay. Stop what you're doing, drop to the ground, and roll away from the fire. Right? I love it. Yeah. Under the smoke. I took it and I turned the engine to stop, think, and respond. Love it. You should Before get a tattoo react, of that. Stop. <laughs> think about what you're going to say. Think about your feelings. Think about are you taking this personally? And you may even say something to the person of, you know, that's interesting. I need a little time before I reply. And then respond. Yeah. And that was a big thing for me to change. It, you know, in the course of doing this podcast, um, and my, I remember the very first episode I did, I never wanted to leave a moment of silence. You know, I always wanted to immediately respond or immediately have something of worth to say. And then as, I mean, if you have the time, you can go through all my podcast episodes and you can see that, like, I give myself more time, right? And one person that's super good at this, and I've said this before, is is um, Jordan Peterson, is that, and, and just, like, smart people in general, you can, they really stop and, and it's almost, like, awkward to just sit there while they think about their response. But... Um, but it's great because then what they say is just perfect, you know. Like it's it's <laughs> thought through, it's 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 purposeful. It 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 has um, a beginning, middle, and end. You know, it's sort of like writing an essay type of thing. But but right. um, but yeah, it's just getting comfortable and then um, giving yourself the space, right? So and 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 it, I guess it ties back to being a people pleaser, right? It's like oh. I need to respond quickly or someone's right. going to judge me or, you know, so. Yeah, exactly. hundred <laughs> percent. So, yeah, no, I get it. I get it. And uh, that's who I was. And once I understood it, once I was aware that these were my default tendencies, mm-hmm. I needed to change them. Not for to save my marriage, not for my children, but for me and my happiness and my understanding that it wasn't serving me. And I needed to find the way, the things that do, to be who I authentically wanted to be. Mm-hmm. So it took a lot of time, and I wish I would. T- I wish I could say that as soon as I came up with this idea of stop, think, and respond, I used it, and it worked right away. No, it, it was trial and error, and it was me understanding. I mean, it actually started uh, as a result of going through coaching with my divorce. My ex would call me up, and she would say something like. I don't want to fight, but now in my head, I heard, I want let's to get ready to rumble. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I would go, okay, let's get into this because, and then she'd tell me what it was. And now my emotions were heightened because she said, this is going to be a fight. And I'd start freaking out. And she'd go, but I told you I didn't want to fight. Right? But she'd already switched the button. She'd already hit my hot button. Right. And this way, she was, you know, she gave herself the out, saying, I told you I didn't want to fight, but you decided to fight anyway. And I realized, you know what? She's right. I didn't hear her correctly. But I needed to, for her to understand, please don't say those words because they are triggers for me. Hmm. So, and I, I, I basically conditioned her and me at the same time, like Pavlov's dog, to not say that anymore. Like she would call up and she'd say, I don't want to fight, but... And I went to the complete extreme. I'd say, okay. And I'd hang up on her. Hmm. And I was like, well, what the heck did you just do? I said, well, you said you didn't want to fight. And then I had to find the the balance of, oh, okay, you don't want to fight. Well, then don't come to me this way. Tell me what the issue is. Hmm. Let's talk it out. And it was about me understanding that she was trying to get a reaction out of me, whether it was conscious or subconscious. And it's about me recognizing what kind of reaction should I give? And over time, that reaction became an, a response instead. It's almost like, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's almost like maybe she was giving you an opportunity to lead, right? To, to like not be pushed or not be, for her to like not be able to push her button. Um, does that make any sense been, to you? It, yeah. it could be, it could be. Uh, in a way, she's saying, you know, I'm, 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 I have something I have to talk to you about. It's going to key you up, but I'm telling you, don't get keyed up. 
-hmm. But in my head, it's, it's, there's a great saying that, that I learned in coaching. What I say is about me. What you hear is about you. Mm. Right? So even though she, in her head she was trying to not have a fight, what I was hearing was, this is a hot issue that you're going to get upset about. So you better get ready to, to, to defend yourself, to fight, whatever it is. So yeah, that's... you're right. It could be that she was trying to warn me that this wasn't going to be a fight, and I heard it differently. Yeah, I think everybody, and, and this comes into the second rule from, from, uh, that we were talking about, right? Um, everybody, a way to better uh, not, not take things personally is just to realize that everybody sees the world through their own lenses, right? Uh, through their own lens. And, um, and everybody is stuck in their own head, and the more you realize that everybody's stuck in their head and seeing and seeing everything through their own lens, the more you can um, not take things personally, right? You, right, you realize right, everybody has and their it's own practice, issues. And it's, it's, it's muscle memory, mind mm -hmm. muscle memory. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned that, um, that the divorce was the best thing that happened to you, and I, was, and I feel like we sort of passed over that a little yeah, bit. Yeah. But, but if you don't, I mean, you know, open up as much as you, as you like. Yeah, no, but, it's all good. At the yeah. time, I didn't feel that. But again, uh -huh. you know, we, we talked about this earlier about the low points. I look at the low points as defi if, there are others as well, but I look at that there are defining moments in your life, good and bad. And it's what you do with them. And you may not even recognize it in the moment. Most of the times you don't, that this is a defining moment until you look back later, if you're aware enough to say, oh, this is how it affected me. And that's what happens now for me to look back and say, that one moment in time when she said she wanted a divorce, at the moment, I was devastated. It took a wide me, all this, right? But looking back now, it got me to understand as I went through coach training that we were in a codependent relationship that we could have never gotten out of unless we were away from each other. The more we were with each other, the more it was just going to be that codependent type of a relationship. And as hard as it was at the time for me to recognize that our values were not the same. I didn't know what values were until I started going through coach training to really understand values. Our values were never aligned. So when I started dating and I told you I got married again, one of the things I would do on the dates would interview the women about what their values were. Now, they didn't know they were being interviewed. It was just a conversation. But I was learning about them and seeing do my values align with what this woman is talking about? And most of the time, no. And this one time, I got, went out on a date, and she was hitting the values. She was hitting them. Went again, hitting them again, checking the boxes. About mm -hmm. a month into this, I turned to her and I said, you know, I got to tell you something. And you don't need to say it back to me, but I'm falling in love with you because I love who you are and I love that you see me as I am and you're not trying to change me. And two weeks later, she told me she loved me and we've been married for almost six years. Beautiful. Yeah. But so, yes, at that time, it was devastating. But looking back now, it was a gift. It just wasn't gift wrapped in the typical way. It was me being looking for the way to get out of to, to move from this and make it a good thing and make it work. And that's what it is. So what advice do you have to young men that are venturing into their first marriage, I guess? <laughs> oh. Be careful to think with the right head. The one that's above your neck. <laughs> not the one that's below your waist. Mm. <laughs> yeah. I think... Um... I think a lot, I mean, a, a sentiment that I've heard from a lot of friends is that divorce sounds like a failure. Because, I mean, if you think about it a little bit, guys are very, like, everything's a competition, everything's, you know, success, failure, all that type of stuff. Um, maybe call it evolutionary, right? So then they see, okay, like, failure in marriage would be a divorce. Um, and I'm not defining it that way. I'm just saying how most yeah, men yeah, see yeah, it, I get it. And, right? Yeah, yeah. And um, uh, so I feel like a lot of guys put pressure on themselves for that. And then 
Yeah. Then also, and they also don't go through this type of work before they jump into a marriage, right? And so then there's sort of people pleasing and all, all the stuff we've talked about, right? Um, so it's, I think it's very important for a guy um, to go through this type of work and realize what their values are, like you said, and then what type of person they want to show up as, what type of man they want to show up as in a marriage and in life, and to have that you know, as clear as possible before getting into, um, maybe not yes. a relationship, but, you know, a, a marriage, right? Uh, yes. Especially if, if they value that and want to have a, a, a lifelong relationship, so. Right, and you know, Andres, part of the part of the issue here is is that we're all conditioned to believe that failure is a negative, terrible thing. Mm. And it's not always the case. It's what are you learning from what didn't happen that you hoped would happen, that you could then take into the next phase of your life, into the next thing you're working on. It's not just relationships. It could be the project you're working on. It could be anything. And it's about understanding how much is... Look, you know, you talk about somebody like Thomas Edison. You failed a thousand times before you finally figured it out. He goes, I didn't fail a thousand times. I found out a thousand ways not to build a light bulb. Right? It's the same thing. Of course, there's emotions involved. Especially, you know, men don't like to talk about their emotions. They just don't. They think it's, it's weakness. And, you know, thank God for people like Brene Brown, who brought the word vulnerability out of the closet. Literally. And said, it's okay to be vulnerable. It's okay to ask for help. It's not a weakness. I grew up in a, in a time when if you said you needed help, or if you showed your emotion, you were looked at as weak. And it's not that way. If you show your vulnerability to someone you care about, that doesn't mean dump all your problems on them. It means, hey, this is what's going on. How can you help me get through this? How can I communicate this to you? And how can you communicate what I need, right? What we need together. You're building authenticity. You're building a true relationship, whether it's husband, wife, you know, spouses together, whether it's friendships, whether it's business partners, whatever it is, with your children, with whoever, if you have a clear understanding and showing them your authentic side, they can serve you and you can serve them better. Yeah, and I think in general, I mean, again, if, and if any of the listeners don't know who Brene Brown is, you should check out her work. She's done great stuff on like, shame and, and, and things like that. But... Um, but yeah, I think in general, I agree. Um, just observing from you know uh, my grandfather's and all this other stuff, but um, men in general, I think, are starting to realize they can open up. And I'm a big believer in in having um, like a a men's like a group. I guess just a group of friends, right? A because, support group. Right. Yeah. If you can, because I feel like it's easier and better to open up to other men about your issues uh, twofold right it's it's just more comfortable maybe and, and it, it feels safer right in case you're still in that mindset of like you can't open up about your feelings but then also right they can understand you and then better uh and then three the third reason i feel is like okay you're not also putting your problems on your partner uh, on your on your girlfriend, wife, right. whatever it may be, right? So then you're not handing over your problems like that, which I don't feel like is fair. Um, uh, Absolutely. So, but you have so. to also, that person has to go in knowing they're in a safe space, which is hard sometimes. You go into a group, you got to understand the men there, whoever they are, and make sure that they've got your back and you've got their back. It takes a little time of experience and trust to build, you know? So I can understand some of these men that say, oh, my God, I can't, because they're afraid of what could happen if they're not in a safe space. Hmm. So that's something that has to be built into that. Well, like when somebody comes into a group, whoever's starting that group has to set a certain amount of rules. This is a safe space. This is a support. We're not going to take what we hear here and go out and gossip about it, whatever. What we're doing here is to help each other build on ourselves and help others build within themselves as well. Hmm. Yeah, and, and a little bit of that is just not being people pleaser, right? It's like, hey, I'm going to show up and I'm going to 
talk about these things that I need to talk about. And, you know, if, if someone judges me or laughs at me or whatever it may be, then I'm not going to take it personally. Right. I guess it all, it all goes back to that at the end of the yep. day. Right. Oh yeah. hundred percent. hundred percent. Yeah. Um, so yeah, let's, let's maybe change, <laughs> change the topic a little bit here. Um, it's a little bit personal here since I'm trying to uh, do some life coaching in particular, I, I guess you've noticed is I have sort of interest in, in men's coaching in particular. And, um, I, so I was just curious what advice you may have to, to just coaches or men's coaches, um, for people that are starting out. I know you said that you, that you were in some sort of community, uh, and, and took a course or something like that. But yeah, um, well, I, I went to coach yeah. training. I, I, I'm certified, I'm a certified life coach. I went to a okay. fantastic coach training program what was it uh, 11 12 years ago now <laughs> it's, it's a long time ago but i'm still in contact with many of the friends i made there some real right. deep friendships were made because we needed to get vulnerable during those weekends we need to be raw for ourselves so that came out of that as well but mm -hmm. um yeah for me uh what my advice to somebody going into coaching is that one-on-one -on -one coaching is okay but Really, the better work happens when you figure out that if you can do group coaching, it's, it's, a, it's a way of being able to maximize your time, minimize your time, get the most out of your time, excuse me, while maximizing your abilities. What do I mean by that? If you have the right kind of group set up, each person will get their time to have one-on-one -on -one coaching in the group setting. And everybody else that's sitting around on Zoom, let's say, listening, is learning from what that person is being coached on. So it's about understanding that if you set yourself up correctly, you could make a bigger impact and make more money. Okay? It's both. You know, uh, I used to go around saying I want to make millions of dollars. Now I talk about I want to touch millions of lives. And as a result... The money will come. I'm not saying I'm doing this to be uh, philanthropic and all that, but I know I have a value and that in that value I can help others. And if I do it in a group setting, what I say to Andres might help Tom or might help Bob or whoever else might be in the room on something they weren't even thinking about. But now that Andres brought it up, you know what? I didn't think about that. And, and, and it'll help them grow as well. Mm-hmm. Interesting. I've had that experience not so much in like a coaching setting, um, but I've had it in. I'm in a mastermind for different entrepreneurs and such. And masterminds are fantastic. Yeah, um, it's great. And I used to sort of think I was wasting my time when all the other people were talking, until I stopped and and listened. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you gotta be present. This, you gotta right. be willing to be present there. Yeah. And, and masterminds are different than group coaching, you know, for the people out there that's listening. There's a big difference between mastermind and coaching, and the difference is, is that in a coaching session, there's one guy who's leading it all, or one person who's leading it all and helping everybody. In a mastermind, there's one facilitator, right? But everybody else is all contributing at an equal level. The facilitator is just keeping everybody on on task on target you know on time frames or whatever he's not coaching everybody he's just facilitating it and everybody's contributing to everybody hmm. then maybe i was in a coaching call <laughs> <laughs> they call them masterminds when they're not really right right um that's good i'm gonna use that <laughs> all right cool but uh, but great. So do you, and do you think that uh, you have to go through a sort of coaching certification? Do you, do you, I mean, obviously, that's the way that you went about it and you found value. I, I believe but... strongly in it. Mm -hmm. I, I, it's not, it not necessarily for everybody, but I, I believe the skills that I learned there changed my life. Between reading that book and going through coach training, I became Martin 2.0. Mm -hmm. All right? Whereas now, my, my wife, she'll hear stories about me. She goes, I've never seen you like that. 
Well, well that's Martin 1.0. You got lucky. Mm. You never had to meet him. <laughs> right? But so a lot of what I learned in coach training, I applied on myself before I applied with my clients. Okay? If you go to – you don't have to be certified, but I think it's, it's, uh, it's a benefit to be certified because if you go to the right program – they're going to dig deep in you and then help you understand where that helps you and how it's not helping you and how you can move forward to help others on a deeper cellular level. Hmm. Awesome. And you mentioned that you have uh, a book coming out, right? I, I, maybe a book you could came talk out. a little a bit book, about that. I had a book come out recently. Uh, awesome. It's called Warrior to Warrior. <laughs> Warrior with an O to Warrior with an A. All right. it takes is one letter. Yep, all it takes is one <laughs> letter to go from oh, I'm a warrior to ah, I'm a warrior. <laughs> and I also recently came out with, it's kind of like a supplement for the book. It's, it's a card deck. So it's something tangible so that they can pull out a card every once in a while and say, oh, what do I need to work on today without having to flip through the book or go through my whole course or call me up and say, hey, I got something going on. I just need something quick, especially for men. They like... They like uh, immediate answers. <laughs> quick answers, quick solutions. Right. Let's get stuff done. Right, right. Uh, that's good. Yeah, I think like I'm going through um, I'm going through a, a book called Men's Work. Uh, Connor Beaton. He's got he's gotten pretty famous and coming out. In, he's come out in other uh, podcasts. Right. But uh, but his book has um, what's it called? Some like. Uh, sort of tasks at the end of each chapter and that's been great I, I like that so it sort of came to mind when you showed those right like yeah. some some like direction as to what I can do because I've picked up sort of journaling every morning right yeah big and thing. sometimes I sit down sit down and don't know what to write about um and so a little sometimes a little um something to get the mind churning uh, is useful, so I could see I could see myself using that, pulling right, one. Absolutely, and then I using have tasks it. at the end of my chapters. I call them success oh, activities, right? Success. And, activities. and what I did is I became very 21st century. In the front of the book is a QR code. You, hmm. and you could download the entire workbook right there, so that it's not at the end of every chapter. You just download the, the workbook. You have it in front of you, and as you're going through it, it says. Okay, success activity 1A, this is what you got to work on today, or 1B, or success activity 3, whatever it is. And you go work on it, and you, and, and you have it there, because that's doing the real work. And I'm not asking for people to spend an hour, 15, 20 minutes. Don't, get, don't overthink it. Just put down what comes to your mind. Go back later and take a look at it again. You might change it. Who knows? It might be, oh, wow, this is reinforcing. Yeah, I mean... Whenever I go back and reread a book, uh, for example, you always get new things. And, yep. and, but I'm a big proponent of like sitting down and going through these questions because a lot of self-help books don't like, – I feel like that's the reason they don't work, right? Is because there's no work to be done. You just read it, you put it down, you forget about it, and you move forward with your life, right? And there's no um, – there's no, It's theory without practice. You need to practice. Exactly. The exactly. theory is not enough. That's one. When I was putting this book together, and I helped my when I was, it comes from my 12, 13 years of coach train of co me being a mm -hmm. coach, is understanding that it's not good enough just to say, "Oh, here it is. Think about it." They've got to work on it, and that's the practical side of it. That's where the cards come in. That's where the book comes in, and the workshop work, the worksheets, mm -hmm. because you've got to do the work. You know, it's 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 um, it's Einstein, you know. The, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a change. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got to do the work. You've got to be willing to change, which is how I even start my book. It's admission, cleansing, and celebration. Admis admit what's, what's, what you're going, doing right now is not working. Mm -hmm. It's okay. Be admit, admit it. <laughs> <laughs> you're asking someone to admit that their entire life they've sort of been on the wrong path that's a it's, it's not hard. an easy thing to admit you know no it's not it's not I, I had one woman come up to me after she bought my cards we were at a, a conference for a few days and she said i'm on pay i'm on card one admission thank you for giving me permission 
to admit that what isn't happening. I'm like, you're welcome. She didn't need my permission, <laughs> but she got it. Right. Yeah, at the end of the day, it's the hard. only permission you need is your own, right? Exactly. So. It is hard. It is hard to admit what's not working because it's pride comes into, fa- into effect. It's like, wait a minute. There, I've done some good things. Yeah, yeah, you have. It's just weeding out the bad. And so this way you have a bed of flowers that are beautiful without the weeds in them. <laughs> you know, yeah, you want a metaphor. <laughs> right, 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 right. Yeah, I mean, you can't just devalue your entire life, right? I mean, no, you, of course. You, and a lot, I, I've talked to a lot of people and they're like, oh, I'm not smart enough to do this or I'm not this to do that. So that's where it sort of comes into play of like, hey, you've done quite a bit in your life. You, you should reflect and, and realize you know, you, you got a degree, you, you, you went through a career, you, there's, you know, yeah, yeah. Uh, everything Everybody's is perspective, got good in their really. Lives. Right, yeah, and everything is perspective, right? I mean, uh, but then, you know, you don't want to fall into the sort of assigning meaning to things, but, um, but, but you can choose the way you see life, so it's definitely. No question, yeah, yeah. 100%, 100%. <laughs> You could see it as a glass half full or a glass half empty. I prefer to look at it as a glass that's full and overflowing all the time. Right, right, right. And how, <laughs> how I'm curious of is this your first book? No, it's actually my second. My first oh. book was called Recovering from Divorce. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Pertinent. Originally uh, I was a divorce recovery coach when I first started. Hmm. Okay. Made sense. I just got out of divorce. Right. I just finished coach training. And I understood the emotional pains that people were going through as going through a divorce. Hmm. Yeah. I f- yeah. I feel like anybody could sort of reflect on, going back to what I was just saying, right? Like the, you've had experiences in your life, reflect on them, and there's somebody out there that needs help with that, right? So you, yeah. can, you can help anybody, um, or anybody can help anybody with, whatever it is that they're an expert in, right? So Right, exactly. Um, you know, one of the things that people have come back to me about my book and said, man, you get raw in there. You get personal. Mm-hmm. I'm like, yeah, man, I gotta. How do I tell somebody that they've got to change if they don't see that I've changed, that I've done the work, that and it, it, there's some raw stories in there about me. Oh, you and speak about yourself. Like, oh, okay. I'm not alone. You know, shit happens. Excuse my language. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Yeah, it, it's it's nice to realize that other people have gone through the through the same experiences, and it's almost I want to say narcissistic to think that you're the only person in the world that's struggling. You know, it's like yeah. no, everybody goes through struggles, right? So um. yeah, I hear what you say. <laughs> it's like it, it, I wouldn't say it was narcissistic. I would say it's you're not the only victim in the world, but mm. are you a victim? Or, and are you being victimized? Or are you looking at it as a way of saying, this has happened to me, how can I learn from it and become better as a result? Right, and not looking back. So. No, no, okay. No, it's okay yeah. to look back. It's just don't live back there. Mm. Yeah, I mean, you can, I guess what you're saying is use the information if, to your benefit, but don't let, yeah, yeah. Exactly. I see what you're, exactly. I see what you're saying. Yeah. Um. And and so, I guess a little bit more of a technical question along those lines. Since you, uh, I guess when you were first looking for clients, what was your strategy? If you want to talk a little bit more about marketing and, yeah, and sure. how you how you built up your coaching business and all that type of stuff. It's for interesting you say because I've just recently taken a new a new turn on that. But mm-hmm. for years, I would do Facebook. Uh, I would do, you know, Facebook posts and, and mm-hmm. reach out to people. And, and a lot of it was word of mouth, which is good if you can grow enough of a, of a, of a tribe, as it were, of a mm-hmm. following. And then I started doing Facebook live streams and stuff like that. And, and recently, I'm even changing the way I do my Facebook live streams because I realized I wasn't as authentic as I thought I was. Because all I was was, like, giving information. And I meant well. But people were looking at me saying, oh, what are you doing? Tell me they're good. So now I'm kind of changing that. But one of the things I've done recently is I've put together a program because over the years I've been in coaching programs where I've been trying to figure out how to grow my business into crazy numbers, right? 
and, and again, you know, it was a mindset of I wanted to make millions of dollars. And now it's more of a mindset of I want to help a lot of people, millions of people if I could. Right? So, and the problem with a lot of those pro- programs I was in was I spent a lot of money thinking that it was going to be an all-in-one thing. And as I was getting through it and realized, wait a minute, I don't know how to do this and I don't know how to do that. I had nobody there to support me. They already had my money and I was like, okay, wow. So I put together a program now specifically for coaches, but it could work for others as well, that I can help them get to seven figures, a seven-figure business, a million dollars within two years, guaranteed. Hmm. Because the way I do it is, is that over 85% of, of, the co- of the investment into my program doesn't come until you start to see results. Because I've realized this, to get to the first $100,000 takes a system. To get to the first million takes a mindset and a system. But to make more than that, you got to be scalable. Right? So my program teaches people how to put this all together with templates and with things like that to help people get where they want to go. And I'm saying to them, I got skin in the game with you. I'm not asking for all the money up front. I'm asking for you that if you don't give up on yourself, I'm not giving up on you. Amazing. And I'm assuming when you say scalable, you mean having courses and having things like that, right? Because That's part of scalable. The other part of scalable is understanding that, listen, Andres, what is the one thing you want to do most? You want to coach. You want to help people. That's, where I'm, mm-hmm. that's the one thing I want to do, okay? Right. That might be what you're, you might, one thing you want to do might be podcasts, but there's so many other things that come around to doing that, right? So imagine, let's say podcast, you want to do podcasts. Imagine if you could just walk up to the microphone and say, okay, on, everything else is done. The pre, the preset, the, 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 the pre-information, all that, all the preparation right. beforehand. And then the post-production, pre-production and post-production is all done. And all you have to do is move up to the microphone and do you what you love to do. Right. That's not possible right now for many people because they're saying, I have to figure out how to edit. I have to figure out this. They have to move their mindset from not how do I get it done, who do I get it done, who do I get to do it for me? There's a great book I've read recently. It's called Who Not How, which does exactly that. You go from if I spend five hours doing something I don't want to do, and I, I'm worth $200 an hour, let's just say. Mm-hmm. I've just wasted $1,000 of my time. I could probably find somebody who could do it better than me in an hour and spend 50 or or $100. Now I've saved $900, $800 maybe mm-hmm. because I'm working smarter and I'm looking for the right people around me. Robert Kiyosaki says, you know Robert Kiyosaki? Rich dad, poor dad. I want to be the dumbest guy in my own business. And I say, the people that know how work for the people that know why. Hmm. That's not taking away from the people that know how. They are very, very important in my life. And I respect them to the nth degree because they know how to do it. And they have their why. But in my big picture, they know how to do things I don't want to know how to do. Yeah, I think not, uh, I guess, delegating or letting go is the difficult part, right? It's, right, it's and that's where this book, like, who not how comes into play, and mm-hmm. my course, okay? My, my new thing that I was just talking about, my new program, because it shows you how to let go of those things and not fear it. Hmm. Can you over-delegate, do you think? You could. You could, because... You always want to have a hand in it. I have meetings with my people every week where they tell me what's going on and I have input. But at the end of the day, if they're telling me this is how it's going to work and that's their expertise, as long as I don't agree with what they're doing, go with it. But I need to understand it on the, at the very best, at the very least, the surface level because it's my name, it's my reputation. Mm-hmm. And if I'm not doing that, then, then, um, then that's like absentee management. 
And another thing that I that I think often of coaches that have courses and all this type of stuff is like it feels like I'm not showing up, right? Like I'm um, not the one helping. Uh, but you can, I mean, that's all perspective, right? It's like yeah. you can say, I, you know, you're the influence of this information. You're you, you're still touching all those people's lives. You just need to um, realize that if you want to reach more people, you can't do it all yourself on a Zoom call, right? So right, right, exactly. You only Look, have so many I have, hours I have in a day. My course. The uh, I uh, two three years ago I built a course. It's called the Warrior to Warrior course, right? It's up there in the cloud. Anybody who buys my course, it's six modules and the whole thing. But now what I'm doing with this new part that I was just talked about, which I call risk reversal strategy, right? The risk is reversed. It's on me more just as much as it's on you, right? Right. Is I've also built in that when they sign up for my coaching to become the millionaire that they want to become that they also have to be ready to do the mindset work remember i talked about first is system then mindset to get to a hundred thousand is system to get to a million is mindset you got to have the right mindset so they get access to my course and then when we get on the coaching calls we talk about what they went through there and i help them get through that as well so that's a way of of you know marrying the two together hmm. beautiful so where can people find your book? I'm interested in reading it. <laughs> so you can, this, you can go to connectwithmartin.com. Awesome. How's that for simplicity? Straightforward. <laughs> right? You go there. You can get my book. You can get the cards. There's free things you can get there. Like, um, you know, some of the things, like Stop, Think, and Respond might be on there that we talked about earlier. Going deeper into that, I have a couple of other things. You could click on a button to have a phone call with me, a Zoom call with me for free. It could be to talk about anything you want. If you want to learn about this new risk reversal guaranteed to million, it's called the Abundant Entrepreneurs, uh, the Seven Figure Abundant Entrepreneurs Launch Program. Awesome. You want to become an abundant entrepreneur? I'll help you get there. I love it. Awesome. Well, uh, thanks so much, Martin. It's been great chatting and... Um... Yeah, maybe we could do some this again sometime. So. Absolutely, it'd be my pleasure.